Welcome to another uh, oral history interview in the uh, Ozarks History, Culture, and Life series. My name is Tom Peters. I'm the Dean of Library Services at Missouri State University. Today's date is Tuesday, October 8th, 2019, and we are at the Rockwood Club, the famous Rockwood Club in the south side of Fayetteville, Arkansas. And our guests today are Mark Risk and Sandra Cox Birchfield. Who are uh, working together to renovate this historic club? Mark and Sandra, thanks so much for coming and being with us today or inviting us into this amazingly historic venue. So, um, Ronnie Hawkins owned this venue, 61 to 65? 64. Okay, 61 to 64. Yes. Ronnie Hawkins and the Hawks. I, got, I learned about Ronnie from reading Testimony, uh, Robbie Robertson's uh, memoirs. Mm -hmm. And he talks about coming down to Fayetteville from Toronto and joining this band, which eventually morphed into the band. Um, so tell us a little bit, maybe we should start with the, the, the cl this club was built in 47, opened in 47? Yeah, fall of 1947. Yeah, okay. So. Is there a story behind, well, let's talk with, the main thing was, this was outside the city limits. That's exactly right. Um, when this club opened, yeah, it was outside of the city limits. The uh, person who opened the club, named George Lennox, he and a bunch of other people who were college students had a club in north of Fayetteville called Club Razorback, you know, for the Arkansas Razorbacks in the mascot of the University of Arkansas. And um, it got annexed into the city. Oh. And back then, Fayetteville had this ordinance, and it, it was kind of modeled after the one in Little Rock, that said that you couldn't serve beer and have dancing under the same roof. And in fact, from what I've read, it was beer. It wasn't like just alcohol, it just said beer. I think it may have been just the only thing that was legal at the time, because you think about it, it's like, what, about 15 years after Prohibition, and so, you know, liquor laws are pretty conservative. They opened up that club, Club Razorback 46, 47, it's annexed into the city. <laughs> Man, and they even like broke up the building. It's so that people could dance and then go out and then go back into a separate entrance so to a separate room and dance. You could drink and dance, but not under the not under the same the same room. thing. But I think I think it's probably safe to assume that was a miserable failure. Right. So um, they started. He started a plans down here in South Fayetteville, um, south of Fayetteville, and uh, it was I guess just kind of a basic box plan. They recruited an architecture student, Faye Jones, who is a noted architect here right. in, in Arkansas, right. and he was an understudy of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright years later. Right. But this was his first project, and for years and years, people said, oh, that's not true. He never worked on it. But he gave an oral history with Roy Reed, who was a former uh, New York Times reporter who uh, taught journalism at the U of A, University of Arkansas, and he was doing an oral history, much like what you guys are doing. And he, he fessed up. He said, yeah, I worked on it. And he gave very specific details on what he did. Really? Yeah, he never said he was the architect. He just said that he was he consulted on it. So he worked on it. Yeah. And and he was still in college. He was still in wow. college. So And so Roy Reed asked him, Is, would this be your very first architecture project? And he said, yeah, I guess I guess it very well could be. You yeah. know, but he was kind of reluctantly reluctant to admit it, but yeah, he, he did. Because he, he called it a honky-tonk. He wasn't real proud of it. Yeah. And I mean, <laughs> of honky -tonk. And I mean it was. It was kind of like a place that college students go and bring their beer and dance and get into trouble. So it yeah. wasn't really probably the most reputable place. Yeah. But early on, my sense was, when it first opened, it was more like a dinner and a dance, you know, more of a I, you wanted to go on a, a good date kind of thing. And I know? think that's what they wanted to be because at the very beginning, they had, you had to have, it was a $10 membership fee for each semester. Oh. Now, this is 1947, and I actually did the inflation calculator. That'd be like almost $100 per semester. Wow. Now, imagine being a Just college student. Just to get in the door. Yeah. Imagine being a college student today and say, yeah, you can come here and drink and dance, but you got a, you got a $100 per semester fee to pay or yeah. membership and there was a backlash about it in the student newspaper, and they they make little sarcastic remarks yeah, and, about the Rockwood. Yeah, and the and How the uh, and the owner would uh, he even ran ads defending the practice, saying that he had to make a living too, which which I don't know was the best marketing <laughs> plan, <laughs> but. <laughs> And so but it, they did all right, evidently, um, as yeah, a business. I guess. I mean, it kept going, but it, it changed ownership through the years. But 
But, um, and they'd have their liquor license, seems like, and then it, then you notice that they're applying for it again. You wonder what happened. And, uh, you know, there, there's been, there, there have been crime reports. There, there was an old Western style robbery here back in the late 40s where they came in, nervous gunmen came in and were firing bullets everywhere. And, really? And there, it turned out to be just a bunch of teenagers. Doing when, it was, when it was open and occupied? Yeah, I think it was like towards the end of the evening. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Wow. So it, 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 it was a colorful place because it was out, you know, it was out in the county at the time. Yeah. Now you were saying it was, it, so, so you're trying to restore the building. Yeah. Uh, it's it's going to be a combination of maybe restoring and then uh, adding some stuff to it. Okay. Uh, there's, there's some, uh, the stage that's here, there is no stage here now, aside from where the original stage uh, was, we're kind of commemorating that there with a <laughs> makeshift stage for the time being. but. The plan is to have a, a new stage built on this other end of the building, and it will be a much bigger stage. And that's going to require uh, going outside the building a little bit. And uh, so uh, it's a combination of restoring it and then uh, renovating, I guess. Yeah. But you plan to have it as a music venue? Again. Yes. Okay. It'll be, uh, yes, uh, a music, uh, we're going to call it an event center, and we hope to have additional things besides uh, music, probably uh, wedding receptions, high school reunions. If I ever get like married that. again, I'm coming here. I'm just yeah. telling you. Okay, we're good. <laughs> and you know, it was an event rental. They did that even in the early days. They would yeah. have private parties and stuff. So it's really not unlike what was being done in the beginning. Yeah. yeah. Now, when, do you know when they started playing music here? I think early on. Just right, right from the very beginning, right. like like the I think local bands mainly. Yeah, groups called the Sentimental Swingsters. <laughs> one of them. And uh, there was the was it the Rockwood Rhythm something? Um, I have the list, but it, it was just local musicians. Um, one cool thing was that there was an African American musician by the name of Buddy Hayes who used to play here, and he had an integrated band. Hmm. And this would be like right in the early fifties. Wow. So, uh, and Buddy Hayes was uh, an inspiration to Ronnie Hawkins. Mm -hmm. So it, so you see kind of this history of music unfold very here at the building, you know, from, yeah. from he was kind of a jump blues musician who played the trumpet, sort of like Louis Armstrong. And he didn't, let's see, Ronnie Hawkins' dad was a barber? He was a barber, and, 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 and Buddy and Hayes was a, worked at the same he, shoe, he was a shoe shine. Shoe shine guy. Yeah, 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 he shined yeah. shoes. In Huntsville? Well, well, here in Fayetteville on Dixon or... Street, where the main college Oh, they moved. They start, he, Ronnie was born in Huntsville. Yeah, right? they moved Which here. is east of here, about, what, 20 miles? Yeah, and, yeah. He, and they moved like here when he was a child. Five. Okay, so he grew up, spent his formative years. Yeah, he was. He went to high school at Fayetteville. Yeah, and what, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but Ronnie was, you know, I'd say he was a wild man, pretty much. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that hasn't changed. Yeah. At 85, 86, he's still pretty wild. Yeah, but he had, he's very charming. And, he's he's and, a sweet uh, man. Yeah, and he, he really he's is. just you know you can't uh, not like him. Right? Yeah, <laughs> kind of guy. So yeah. everybody likes him. Yeah, no matter how obnoxious at times he can be. But, uh, <laughs> he's enter he's entertaining, fun guy to talk to. Yeah, and he's still uh, still he could be a, a stand up comedian. Yeah, <laughs> he's and he was just down here in August. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right for the uh, roots uh, Fateful Roots Festival. Uh huh. And he doesn't come back too often. No. My knowledge, no. It's maybe the last time he comes. He says he wants to come back. That was one thing he kept saying. I want to come back one more time. I think he really loved the reception here. So yeah, and he's now eighty-five. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So um, eighty-four. Yeah. And he grew up. Eighty-four. Uh, eighty-four. Uh, I I think think birthday is it? J he said it was two days J after Elvis. Yeah. January tenth, nineteen thirty-five. Okay. Yeah. So he's he's eighty. And I think maybe it's two days before Elvis. Elvis is well, maybe it was. It was two well, days away. So this is a ten. Yeah. yeah, there's two days difference between him and Elvis in okay. age. Wow. What's up? Um. So, uh, Mr. Lennox, mm -hmm. how long did he operate the business? Not very long, up until about the early fifties. Okay. And then what happened? Well, yeah, this has nothing to do with the Rockwood Club, but he made national news. Yeah, well, what he what had happened was he left. Um, he was supposed to go to law school here. In fact, he I don't know if he ever completed it, but in some of the articles it said that he was going to go to law school, set up an office down in the basement, run the club, and study. I don't know how anybody could do that. But that was, I thought, okay, great, good for you. Run the club and the soundboard. Yeah, yeah. I don't think they had soundboards back then, so it was pretty. Um, 
So he goes, he moved, he's married, he moves to Memphis. He works as, I believe, a bank teller. And I'm just getting this information from what I've read from newspaper articles. And he becomes a very successful banker. In fact, he begins, he begins selling tax-free municipal bonds. Becomes a multimillionaire. Um, big, big shot in Memphis. Um, and he still owned the Rockford? Or? No, he sold it probably. He sold, he sold it in the early 50s. Uh -huh. But um, in 1964, 65, he bought a Tennessee walking horse for $125,000, which was at the time considered the highest amount of money ever paid for a horse. What's a walking horse? A Tennessee walking horse. It was just some kind of show horse. Yeah, yeah I it's know. Not, it's not for racing, but just for show. I, maybe must, I guess show so. Horse. Show horse? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it must oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, and so um, sometime around 1970, he had farms, I guess a farm in northern uh, Mississippi. So he drives down there, and two, two, year, I mean, two hours later, he's found murdered on the side of the road. Hmm. And uh, it took about two years to, con you know, to charge somebody, but um, it turned out it was linked to the Dixie Mafia. Huh. Yeah, it, it's just kind of like something out of a John Grisham novel. Yeah, because yeah, because he he had an interesting history to begin with. He like was supposedly born on a houseboat, from what I read, and in on that White River in Stuttgart, and used to dig up mussels to sell. They made buttons out of them back right, in the day. Yeah, and uh, I mean, it just just that was that, a big thing. The, the yeah, the mussels for buttons. right, but, but, I mean, but it's just such an interesting story about how he was born on a houseboat on the White River. Wow. He was in the Merchant Marines during World War Two. Um, came here, leaves, opens this club, leaves, yeah. and then becomes this um, really successful um, tax free municipal bond dealer, and uh, and then has this awful yeah, ending. Murdered, murdered, huh? And they really don't know the motive. Um, they the guy really? that they pegged it to said they never told him why. He was just paid. It was a murder for hire, and so he didn't even know. He didn't know why it was. So that's one of the big mysteries. Huh. So. Oh, back, back to your question, how long did he, he, did he own it? From about 1952, yeah. 53. He actually, from what I know of the record, uh, he uh, only had it a couple years and then sold it. But then he got it back. That's right. Uh, so oh. I guess, and it looked like somebody we heard maybe was a dentist had fi financed this for him. He'd gotten a loan on it. Uh -huh. uh, he's, he's only like 23, 24. Yeah, he's young guys in college, you know, but he's a vet, or I guess World War II, you know, GI Bill thing or something right. there, because yeah. he was a little bit older than a normal right. student would be. But uh, he uh, got it back, you know, he had operated apparently for a couple of years, got uh, sold it on probably a contract, and then gets it back uh, within about a year or two, and holds it for another year or two, uh -huh. mm -hmm. and then he bails out and goes, I guess, moves on to Memphis. Memphis yeah. yeah. Um, and didn't I see something when Ronnie was in college? He was like running around to Memphis mm -hmm. to make extra money. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah, going down no, the Beale Street. A, yeah, his book. He claims he was a uh, yeah. Right, right. I don't know. Well, if I he thought did. it was right around here, but yeah, maybe I don't, going all the way to Memphis. I, I don't know. know if he did or not. I think he liked going to Beale Street. He wanted to hear the blues music, right. and uh, he um, apparently had. Um, Auditioned at Sun Studio. Really? Yeah, and it didn't it didn't take. Uh -huh. And so I think he was embarrassed to come back, and so that's when he started heading off to Canada. Like that that was his story, you know, because right. he was telling everybody he was going to Memphis to be a star like Elvis. So then it, it continued the, the club continued in operation throughout the fifties. Oh yeah. Various owners. Yeah, yep. it, it uh, seemed to be, you know a business. So somebody would buy it and they would own it for two or three years, and then they'd sell it. So it was a pretty well uh, in and out of here at times, you know. And probably in the mid '50s, uh, Pick and Beulah Peterson mm -hmm. uh, got the building, and they, we think, are the ones that, that began to bring in yeah. the national acts. And they may have been working with Ronnie Hawkins, but so uh, I, I don't. I'm not. Sh it's still not clear to me how that worked out. Well, yeah. But they, they uh, started having you know named acts here. They, they uh, apparently lived in a trailer. There was a house trailer out here, uh -huh. and they, they lived in it, ran this place. Now, the original building, was, we think, was hit, was in phases, but the original building is where we sit here in this room, and it right. probably went to the other side of these walls here, but that's actually two levels there. There's a lower level right, right. and an upper level. 
but uh, so we don't know when this back room was added on, but apparently that was added on that became a steakhouse. See, I'm thinking it's late 50s after yeah. they had that fire. Oh, okay. So, so then, then they sort of stopped with the music. No, they did both. I yeah. mean, it was still music was the main thing here. It was, all I said is come dancing and come eat a steak. Yeah. You know, yeah. so. Uh, and lobster tails. Yeah. So yeah. it was kind of an upscale yeah. restaurant for a while there in the, in the 50s. Uh -huh. And then, let's see, uh, that's, and Chicken Beale owned it right up to Ronnie Hawkins buying it. That's he right. He bought it from them in 61. Yeah. But it already had, you know, guys like Harold Jenkins coming down here who became kind of late Twitty. And Roy Orbison had already been here. Yeah, it yeah. was probably by this point. Oh, the champs were here in the 50s. Yeah, oh, 60, right around the time, yeah. right before he bought yeah. it. Yeah. So it was a kind of a circuit where some of these artists would. Oh, yes. Sure. Kind of, you know, I know when I was in Kansas City in the 80s, I think the circuit for blues people was like New Orleans, kind of up to Chicago. And back down through the camp. You know, it's kind of like one side of the Mississippi up, come down the other side, mm -hmm. just kept, kept doing a big circle. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know if we tapped any of that here. Uh, the, the circuits I've heard of were, were a little later when Dayton Stratton had the place, and, which would be in the times that uh, Hawkins owned it, and then yeah. uh, probably four or five years in there, period there. But uh, Stratton had a bar in uh, Oklahoma. There were other bars in Joplin, uh, Tulsa. And he managed it when Ronnie yeah. Hawkins. So oh. there was a circuit, a more regional circuit around here where like the Tulsa musicians, uh, Boyd Bridges who became Leon Russell, J.J. Kale. You know, these guys would come well, over Wanda here. Wanda Jackson too. Yeah. yeah, so there's a lot of, actually a lot of good people, uh, musicians in Oklahoma. Yeah. And so this was part of their little stopping ground. They'd get over here and then Southwest Missouri, right? But, but there was part of this circuit. But there were Memphis people too. I mean, uh, Sonny Bridges and the Pacers, even though they're from East Arkansas, they were a big Sun label act, yeah. and they'd come through here. And there was some. I'm trying to think. Billy Lee Riley played here. He was with yeah. Sun. Well, and, you know, University Towns. I think, right, were, right. Were, uh, kind of a mainstay of mm -hmm. some of those two. So you got a little bit of Oklahoma, and you got a little bit of the Memphis, the Rocky Memphis stuff yeah. that was going on. So I'm confused now. So when when Ronnie owned it. He wasn't actually in town? No. Not much. He was already uh, already relocated to uh, Canada, and most of their shows were up there. But in the wintertime, when it was cold up there, they'd come down here for a couple months. Yeah. But when it was warm, they were touring Canada most of the time. They played a Christmas Eve show here one time. So I was telling you, I've read testimony, but it's been a while. So Robbie Robertson got on the bus and came down here. That's right. Yeah, that's Incredible uh, first page yeah. of that book yeah. for us I mean, here. I, I didn't I think know. He was like 16 that. years old. Right. Yeah. He wasn't even, you know, mm -hmm. um, somebody right. convinced his mom to go into Arkansas. Yeah, and can you imagine how crazy that would rock be? Band was a good thing to do. Well, yeah, but how could <laughs> you convince? Well, I guess uh, Ronnie must maybe talk to, talk to her. I think he made a convincing he, kind he of. He was a, a guy who could talk you into anything. Like Eddie Eddie Howard had already been up there he, and convinced. Yeah, they, uh, the story, uh, I guess I got a testimony too, is that uh, uh, Robbie's band was playing, uh, his first band or something was there at the, an arena, yeah. and they were like the first or second band, and the, the Hawk, Hawks were the end, and uh, he saw them then and decided, hey, I, this is what I want to do, and he started buddying up with them, yeah. and finally they let him kind of become a roadie with, with him for a while. Yeah. And, uh, and he came down here. I mean, they must have been like they were wintering down here or something. Yeah, probably were. Yeah, and then the rest is history. All right. Um, became the band. Um, so, uh, well, I, I, you know, as far as we know, uh, which is maybe limited, but Earl Cape, if you know the Cape Brothers, and Earl, they play here as the Del Rays, but he's an eyewitness of this, but he... He told uh, me and the other people that he was here the night that uh, all five of the band guys played together for the first time. Mm -hmm. And that was when Richard Manuel and his band came down here. Hawkins had booked them for a month and uh, brought him down here and his band intending to try to recruit him to become a singer and yeah. also keyboard guy, I guess, with the band. And it worked, and but uh, the first time all those five guys played together right here in this club. Right, yeah. Yeah. So I think that's kind of historically significant, mm -hmm. especially for a little town like Van Arkansas. Yeah. 
So at that time, what was the clientele mainly college students? Yeah. Yeah. So it's like a, just a good place to go and say. Yeah, fraternities, sororities. Um, yeah. I've been told, I read somewhere, I think it was just on, on social media, that whenever the Hawks would do Who Do You Love, that song, that yeah. different fraternities and sororities would shout out their house <laughs> you know, during the different breaks. So, uh, and, uh, and you see in, around that time, there are pictures in the, in the yearbook of them, quote, studying, kind of a tongue-in-cheek references in the yearbook. Right. But, and, uh, at the Rockwood. So. so we're not sure... Uh, uh, if it was a college club in the early 50s and late 40s when it opened, it almost seemed like it was a little up, a little higher class than that. Yeah, maybe. a little upscale. A little more, more upscale. But, yeah. but somewhere it made that transition, certainly when St uh, Stratton had it, um, it was a college. Well, what I was told, it was college to a point in time in the evening, and then it became the locals and the hardcore guys. Oh. So it was kind of like they had, like, we have another club in town right now called George's that does you know they kind of run the old people through first and then the young you know, old and older people the younger people then the really young people they get three different shows in that night well they were kind of doing some of that here and so you would have the college crew in here and, and for a certain couple few hours but a lot of them they were under a curfew back then I didn't oh, know that but yeah had to be back on campus. yeah they had the girls especially had to be back in their yeah. rooms by like 11 o'clock and stuff so that ends that and then the nightlife of fat well, the older people come in after that. And this kind of rowdier stay. crowd, you'd yeah, say? Yeah. yeah. They'd stay yeah. open till beer drinking and you know. one o'clock or something like maybe two. I don't I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. but, but when I was growing up most places stayed open till two. Right. That was the mm -hmm. Iowa. So I don't know what it was down here. Uh, uh, it's, it's been out it's been as late as five in the morning. Yeah. But uh, most of the time it's been two. Yeah. yeah. Until not or like a few years ago. I, it's, it's, I go to bed early. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, eventually, the city incorporated this part of right. the area. Yeah. But by that point, it didn't make any difference. Or... Right. Um, well, here's what happened. In 1967, Fayetteville finally did away with the beer and the dancing ordinance. Oh. It wasn't until 67. <laughs> and uh, we, you know, Dixon Street is now the, the college drag, which is full, filled with nightclubs, but it wasn't until after that happened. Oh, okay. So, yeah, but by then it was, it, by then it wasn't even the Rockwood Club anymore. I think at that point it was the Moose Lodge or Elks or what was it? It was. <laughs> well, in the 70s, one time it was St. Michael's Disco Alley. Right, right. but it's yeah. been several yeah. different things. Now, that was his last music yeah. incarnation was as a disco yeah. Right. place. Yeah. yeah. Remnants of the, but it was known as the yeah, RNS yeah. Club in '65 as a, you know, I think they were trying to be like a London swing and discotheque in '65. <laughs> then I think either it went, I think then that was it became the Moose Lodge. Then it became the Rock. It was Frank and Edna's Rockwood Club, and it was just strictly country music. But Conway Twitty played as Conway Twitty during that time, and uh -huh. I, there was a local Frankie Kelly used to play. He was a local fiddle player, uh -huh. and then it became something called the Flaming Arrow. And then I think it flipped back to the Rockwood Club, and then it became St. Michael's Disco Alley, and then it just ceased operation as a club. After yeah, that. and then it became like a daycare. Center. Daycare. I think that was very brief. <laughs> I can't even imagine. Yeah, but, and um, then after that, it just became almost like a, just a store. Yeah, it was just place. personal, yeah. For whatever, yeah. workshop, office space. Yeah, so, yeah it was a fairly, uh, um, fairly large uh, property management outfit. They, well, they, they owned all their own pro They had a bunch of properties. Right. And they used this as their headquarters to kind of store stuff, take care of it. But they had an office here uh, where people would come in and pay the rent and uh, you know, request repairs or whatever. And that was here 35 years. Yeah. Now, I've, I've read somewhere that a young man by the name of William Jefferson Payne used to frequent the place. True? That's what he says. Yeah. He admits? Oh, yeah. yeah. In his book, right? Well, I, there's footage. He's in that. He, he mentions it in the documentary that Larry Foley did on Fayetteville. But I have that because um, that documentary is still alive and kicking. He's on there and he talks about it. So yes, he's he. I think he. I don't know if he was underage, but yeah, he said he'd been here. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, so we we think that probably some of the acts that played here were either headed to Springfield to perform on the Ozark Jubilee or had been there recently. That was probably... 
could very well be, you know, uh, we talked about... Wanda Jackson. Right. Sure. Carl Perkins. Mm -hmm. We talked about Sid Street. Sid, Sid, Sid King. King. Yeah, Sid, Sid King, King and the King Five Streets. And right. the fact that you even brought them up and the fact that I've seen them. Yeah. So we need to sort of... We uh, need to coordinate that. Actually. Have you done, in your research, have you... Uh, Either cobble together from you know newspaper ads mm -hmm. like who allegedly performed each weekend. Kind of deal. Yeah, absolutely. It, I, I'm still doing that. It's a never-ending process. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've, I've got quite a few. Uh, okay, so I'll do some with those. Uh, I do believe it. But yeah. You know, if we could prove my sense of the way the business worked, mm -hmm. you perform on those. Our jubilee for the exposure. Nine mm -hmm. million people watching that. You wouldn't get paid a whole lot. You mean right? Right. But then you tour around in the air. Right. That's how you make your money. And then you could say in the advertisement, as seen on the Ozark Jubilee product. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it makes total sense. Mm -hmm. That's probably what was going on. For sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, so people in town, what are their feelings towards the Rockwood Club? Do they get all misty-eyed or? Yeah. Uh, some of that, but it's more like a light bulb goes off and they brighten up and they're like, <laughs> they're excited. I, I can't tell you how many 80-year-old people I've talked to <laughs> and 80-year-old women yeah. that will tell stories about how much fun they had down here and uh, they just love it. Yeah. So that's been a so it's been a, the biggest, most of the reaction to anybody that's ever been here. Everybody yeah. has a story. Anybody who's old enough to have been here and where it's here, everybody has a story. Yeah. It, it, it really has struck a nerve with yeah. the community. Yeah. And, and places like this are amazingly, I mean, the memories are just amazingly uh, bright and uh, Yeah, I remember the good things. Oh, we, we've heard some stories about some bad things. You know, there's, there's been a lot of fights here. Yeah, yeah this place has been on fire before. Uh, Where there were the police. On and, the you know, somebody was running around with somebody, you know, I'm sure. It, That's it, right. It's just yeah. uh, part of it. But yeah. for the most part, uh, the memories are very... Favorable yeah. about how about was it mainly the music or the dancing or just I the, the combination? The totally yeah, absolutely a the combination. Yeah. yeah, you know, and, and it's still not super built up around here, but it must have been back in the day, pretty much out in the country. Yeah. You know, would would they have you know would people mill around outside as well? It was kind yeah, of I think so, but you know, uh, just further down here. I don't even know what's here now, but it used to be a home furnishing place, but that was where the tea table, table was. Yeah. So there were some bars down there because this was the closest area outside the city limits, yeah. like from the town. Yeah. And so they had uh, some other bars that popped up uh, out here. So this wasn't the only place when it was built. Yeah. There were already and this seven. was Highway 71, which right. is the main right. Right. Yeah, yeah, main side. artery at the time. And there's a country club, the Fayetteville Country Club, which I think was built around the 20s or 30s up the road. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I, I kind of partially think that part of the reason they chose the spot is that they could snag some of the country club folks. Yeah, so you think some of those country club folks would stop by and... Maybe and, so, yeah. And uh, hang out. I'm sure they did. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's good, great work that you're doing. Um, Sandra, you mentioned that um, you don't have a lot of pictures yet. Of the place. No, we don't. It's just... That's... Outside and inside. and right. I'm guessing this kind of mansard roof was added probably see that's what I think that's what 70s. we think yeah probably so maybe uh, early 70s so we, you were saying you uh, thought it could be earlier right it could be but there was a this was annexed in the city in 72 and that's the first time uh, anybody got had to get a building permit mm -hmm. and there was a building permit issue just around that time and uh, the mansard was mentioned but uh, I'm not sure if they were building it new then or they were just uh, repairing it yeah based on that because of Permit was really big, big as to that, but something happened at that time, uh, and then that mansard now has been covered up with metal, and so actually wood underneath it. Mm -hmm. But the current, the previous owner had uh, put the metal over it. So put some metal on it. Yeah. Um, somewhere I read as I was, you know, getting learned up, as we say, about the Rockwood Club that. Uh, you also are maybe thinking about a rockabilly museum here? Uh, we definitely want a uh, museum here. We're actually going to call it a museum because it's going to be basically music. Uh -huh. And it's going to be uh, hopefully over in here <laughs> and, uh, and maybe all throughout the entire building. But we want to uh, 
that's one of our main goals and our main dream of this place was, uh, yeah, we like the, the music history here is unmatched anywhere in Arkansas, probably, except some of the clubs in the east side of the state that were close to Memphis. But uh, we'd like to, to uh, bring uh, some sort of attention to the people who have played here and also then uh, honor them and have a museum here yeah. for it. So uh, that's our goal. Uh, I've personally collect, have collected rock and roll memorabilia like Tina Turner over there and yeah. stuff like that and Molly Hatchet behind you and the band uh, for a decade. So I have a pretty decent collection that will, this will give me a place to put it. And there are other people that have expressed, uh, we got this, we might loan it to you, you know, or let you guys put it up down here. So um, we really would like, like to have this as a museum, but we realize that you can't make, probably make a whole lot of money at a museum. Yeah. So the reality is we're gonna have to uh, generate some income to make it work. And that's gonna be as the event center uh -huh. and, uh, and having shows here. Yeah. So hopefully that kind of pays the bills and then we can have fun with our uh, museum for uh, uh, the history of the people who played it, but just right. the area too. Yeah, yeah you, you might, you know, have some really great memorabilia, but we, I'd love for this to be mostly just what's in this area to be about, you know, the Rockwood and Northwest Arkansas. Uh -huh. Because like, like, like Mark was saying, there's a lot of things that are really great musically that just doesn't get the attention and it's just because we really haven't ever promoted it. Yeah. And, uh, so your interest, historical interest, is in? The local music, the local, local history. Music, right. local music scene. Right, right absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The history of the music mm -hmm. scene. So. And, this, and this played a huge role in that. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm thinking of it. Are you, uh, are you aware of uh, the Johnny Cash story in Fayetteville? It's a, uh, I didn't know about this either until recently. We, this one thing, that, since we've been doing it, we're hearing stories about things that happened. And of course, Johnny Cash is from Arkansas, and uh, I, maybe Eastern Arkansas. Eastern Arkansas. Yeah. Arkansas yeah. I don't know if you saw that country music uh, history that was on PBS. Yeah. It's been a lot of time on him, but but uh, he uh, was uh, in 1968. Um, we had a went to Rockefeller, who was a Rockefeller, and moved to Arkansas. And uh, he decided he wanted to become governor. So he decides to run for governor of Arkansas, he which he did. Yeah, he, he was elected. elected. Yeah. He was elected. Yeah. Oh, he may get two terms. Um, yeah. First Republican uh, ever, terms. and then the last one for until recent years. But anyways, he, uh, Rockefeller hired Johnny Cash and his band to play uh, six concerts across the state of Arkansas, and one of them was failed. And uh, he played, a, I guess, a couple of these, and then a tragedy happened, and that was his um, guitar player, Luther Perkins, died in a house fire hmm. somewhere in where he, he lived, not here. And it was um, shortly before he scheduled to play up here, so now he doesn't have a guitar player. And um, supposedly he had contacted Carl Perkins, and Carl Perkins had agreed to uh, come up and be the guitar player. But something happened at the last minute. And I think the flight got delayed, and so he couldn't make it in. He, so he, he couldn't make it here. So now Johnny's decided, I'll just do acoustic, uh, you know, because I don't have a, my guitar player anymore, and don't have one back there. Well, then uh, a woman comes out of the crowd. This is out here uh, in a field between Fayetteville and Springdale, where uh, there is a locomotion now and some softball fields, but back at that, Miller Field between yeah that, at right, that time yeah. it's just north of the mall. It was called Hillbilly Holler. So uh, a lot of people there for the show, you know, it's ready to do this acoustic deal. A lady comes out of the crowd and goes up to June Carter. They had already to, were together by then. And said that to June that my husband's here and he knows every song that Johnny Cash ever played or recorded. And uh, he's willing to come up here and play, play with you, be the guitar player. And she's, well, that's kind of a weird request. So she goes up and talks to Johnny, and Johnny says, bring him on. And so the guy comes on and uh, actually does very well, blows him away, and ends up uh, Johnny hiring to be his guitar player for the rest of his career, mm -hmm. the next 30 years. Yeah. And there's audio of it on YouTube of that concert. So, really? Yeah, it's pretty, pretty cool. Yeah. Any recordings of any? Uh, 
uh, concerts here? Oh, no. uh, uh, yes, they're, they're, I've heard some. Yeah, oh. there are some out there. Oh, at the Rockland? Yeah. Oh, okay. But uh, nobody's ever come it's forward. Like, it's, like pho- it's like the photos. I know they're out there, but it, yeah. there's some. Just a hard time. Well, we've heard that uh, somebody has recorded the Del Rey's here. Really? Yeah. Oh, that'd be but cool. But you know, this Connor, what's his name? Connell Miller. Oh, Connell, yeah. Has told me that about somebody's got a recording somewhere of somebody yeah. here, but it's all hearsay and they're probably lost or gone or you know. So yeah. we have we haven't we don't have our hands on anything like so that. I don't think people knew at the time what a big deal the Rockwood yeah. was. Yeah. But the, the it's crazy that we have been unable to find photos of the exterior, and that's really kept us from getting listed yeah. on the state register or national register. So it's, I, I think what's going to happen is that they're out there and people just don't know what it was. You know, we have to, I found some pictures of Richard Manuel's band online that turned out to be here in the Rockwood Club, but it was identified as something else. Mm-hmm. But I was able to confirm that it was, you know, we got, the, we actually got the pictures yeah, and started, yeah. started well, looking yeah. at the orientation of the cinder block at the corner and it was like identical. Right. It's some of them in that area where that fan was and that vent was and, and, um, I, yeah. yeah, so there's a famous vet over there, and the kids would sit outside because it was so close to the stage if they wanted to just listen to the band. Couldn't get in because they were underage. Right. They'd yeah. sit outside. And, yeah, Earl and Ernie Kate, uh, who at the, Earl told me the story when they were 17 years old, uh, you know, they were just, they were already playing music. I think they had a band already by then, but. Uh, anyways, they couldn't get in there because they were 17 years old, and Jerry Lee Lewis was playing. That, that night, so they came, actually came down in the afternoon, mm-hmm. so they could be the first car over there by that <laughs> exhaust fan. So they parked over there, and they just hung out there all evening and uh, listened to the show yeah. from there. And Earl said it was very uh, significant in his life that they decided they wanted to be rock and roll stars after they saw their first Jerry, Jerry Lewis. But they were listening through a fan, so he said it was like I don't know if you're familiar with the Leslie Speaker. That he, he said it was like listening to him through a Leslie Speaker. <laughs> so when somebody like that would come into town to play, where would they stay overnight? Probably. Well, uh, actually, sometimes at, at Stratton's house, Randy has told me this. Yeah. Son has told, told me that you know, like Con- Conway or. Carol Jenkins, or they were friends with Dayton, and they would just stay at their house. Or stay with Ronnie if he was living. Yeah. So, uh, but there was the, what was the Iris Motel? There was the Iris Motel, Motel, Motel. which is, yeah. There's the Sands of the Iris. Yeah. No longer here. No longer here. No longer here yeah. But, um, no tell hotels. You know, right, right. right. <laughs> yeah. If we had them in town, I imagine that's where some. But yeah, Iris Motel was the one that the band, the Hawks used to live in. Was, was there a restaurant or a cafe or something nearby? Uh, maybe like, it? was it oh, Tasty probably. Freeze is the what I heard. Tasty well, I think it was mentioned in Levon's, Levon Helm's book about how Robbie well, probably, got to yeah, a fight. Yeah. There was a, a where, um, it's a cleaner's now on North College, yeah. I think, by Mermaids. That that was a Tasty Freeze, and I think they used to go there. You, if you drive by, you can see that it used to be a drive-in. You get burgers and stuff. Yeah. yeah. So I think that was where they used to go. And I don't know where else. Um, but... The building's been added on to, you're sure of that. Oh, yeah. And uh, th- th- you did have some fires? Yeah, there, uh, Sanders <laughs> found uh, articles in the paper mm-hmm. about at least two fires uh, that were here. And there is remnants of the fire in the building. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what was kind of amazing about it is one of the fires, uh, I think the one was at 59 or something, that uh, it kind of sounded like it was a pretty serious fire. Uh, and most, a couple of these were arson. I think that one was too. They yeah, they, I don't think they ever found he did it. Yeah, but anyways, uh, they uh, the articles in the paper are like on the twenty fourth of April that there's been a fire here and we're gonna have to shut down. We're trying to get insurance, and then three weeks later they're open again. Oh, I, I <laughs> think May, they, you know, yeah, I think uh, they opened up in sections because I yeah, I think they opened up part of it because I found ads where by several months later it was completely remodeled, which tells me that they probably just, they just opened it enough so they could keep yeah, business they running. Even completely remodeled in three months, and, and we can't it's even right. get. It. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I know. We can't get nothing done in three months but, anymore. That shows you how the system gets just bogged down now. Yeah, I mean, you know. 20s, 30s, 40s, they put up buildings pretty quickly. And, you know, I asked, I asked them. Our, well, they built this unless they, they started it in April and they were open. In yeah, it, it was just, I think it was just know. a square. It was just a yeah. rectangle. You know, there wasn't, it wasn't anything fancy about it. I asked our university architect one 
once and you say, well, you know, they didn't have to go through the, well, now everything's checked. Yeah, I mean, they just threw the electricity, it's checked. You put in the plumbing, it's checked. You know, right. every, every phase of construction gets checked. Mm -hmm. They didn't back then. No. They just did it, you know. So, uh, well, that was the allure of the country, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they had food here all the time, right? All the time? I don't think all the time. Well, we don't know. We really don't, uh, but I understand when Hawkins had it, they, they did have kind of bar food, you know, uh, sandwiches Burgers, and stuff. Yeah. We do know it was a steakhouse yeah. before there was Hawkins like a steak, had it, and steak, probably after, maybe. Steak yeah. and lobster kind of, mm -hmm. seafood kind of place. Yeah. yeah, there's a picture in the UA yearbook, I think from 61, that had, it shows the dining room. They had white tablecloths. White tablecloths, I yeah. think they tried to, you know. Kind of that, it's upscale phase. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Any any memories from the disco era? <laughs> well, I actually worked here for about six months during that era. Yeah. What'd you do? I was a bartender, yeah. but it wasn't much of a being bartender because all they served was beer. <laughs> <laughs> so I was a, a beer pourer. You remember what beer of brands? Well, Pabst, Schlitz, Budweiser, Bush. Okay. Uh, were the stuff. popular beers then. Uh, old style, yeah, that's cheap. And all, yeah. all, all the beers that now are cheap then were premiums. Yeah. Paps was premium. Old style was a premium beer. Yeah. Pre micro brewed, right. yeah. craft beer. Right. And, and it, you know, I still drink it because it's a great beer. <laughs> but back then you had to pay premium prices yeah. for it. Now you get a six pack for three bucks. You, know? you can't <laughs> find Schlitz anywhere around here. I look. No, Schlitz is uh, yeah. Uh, um, I can remember. Uh, some big football players coming in here. And uh, I didn't work the door, so I wasn't responsible for carding people. But uh, when they got over there to the bar, you know, well, I, I presume they're all, you know, legal, so I just served the, the beer. These guys, one of the guys, I won't mention his name, I don't I guess it, it matters, but he is in the NFL Hall of Fame now. <laughs> he came in here and he was like a freshman or sophomore, and he's a huge guy. I'm not going to tell him you can't have a beer. <laughs> so, Is this Lou Holtz era or right before Lou Holtz? Oh, during both. Oh, really? Okay. He, he, when he came okay. here, he was not. Lou Holtz wasn't the coach. Still was Trenton and Lou Holtz after okay. so. But uh, he had a, a great career in pro football in, in, in here. But uh, a couple of his buddies have come in. And this is, has always been uh, somewhat of a hangout for the uh, university athletes and football team from the stories I'm here. It's best, you see, in 1964, uh, in, in Hawkins has had it now several years, but that's the year Arkansas won the national championship in football. It was a co-championship. 64. With yeah. Nebraska or something. Because they uh, they lost in the bowl, but they had already picked who the national champion was, and we won our bowl, so we were declared the national championship by the writers and the coach, the coach. Right, right. Whatever, I don't know the which two one poles, was, but, yeah. uh, two poles. Anyway, so we're national champions. That's never happened again. And at the time, uh, this is where the football players hung out. And you know, he sold the the club to Donnie Stone. Yeah, who, who was played, a football. Who was a football player. Uh, he, he played for the Denver Broncos. Yeah, he was a little bit before the national champion. I think. Yeah, probably. Yeah. But then 50s. by the time he bought it, he was with I think Denver. So. Well, and, and you know, who Barry Switzer is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? He hung out here. Really? Jerry Jones? Yep, Jerry Jones. Jerry, I mean, yeah. the, that Jerry alone Jones is, a, is a whole new avenue that we... It's <laughs> out of Springfield. His family comes up from Oh, really? There you go. There's a connection. Well, <laughs> Jerry Jones, uh, we got pictures of Jerry Jones uh, and several other uh, football players that were on the industrial basketball team for the Rockwood Club <laughs> in 1960. So the Rockwood four. Club sponsored a team? Sponsored a team in an industrial league here, and, and all these football players were on it. Why, why did they like to hang out here, I wonder? Well, uh, they probably Farm got treated They got treated pretty well. And of course, there were girls here. and uh, But there were, uh, Randy, who's Dayton's son, uh, has told me many stories. But apparently, um, Dayton actually had some hiding places here beneath the uh, ABC, which is the Arkansas Beverage Control Commission, whatever, uh, showed up here uh, that they could hide those guys if they were underage. Oh. And that's apparently what they did. They shuffled them into some sort of closet. Probably <laughs> down below there. I, I think we saw that closet. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty so they, they weren't, you know, they never were discovered. So, 
there was a big connection uh, at that. Of course, we were an undefeated football team that year, so everybody right. was high on the hogs. And this was just became the place to hang out. A, a sufficiently discreet place to yeah. hang out. And, and so, uh, uh, you know, I, I've worked in bar restaurants where, you know, there's people that are there at 3 o'clock, and, you know, even though the music isn't starting till 9. Uh, that kind of hanging out, or it'd be like when, no, when uh, the entertainment was going, they'd, they'd be hanging out. Yeah. Well, I, I do know one guy told me that we hung out here. I, uh, that's Chris Polycron. He, he uh, is a realtor. I'm a realtor also, but he's a realtor in, in Hot Springs, Arkansas. And he rose to be president of the National Association of Realtors. There's been a couple from Missouri, but he's the first one ever, that ever only went from Arkansas. But, anyways. I knew he went to school here between 64 and 60, maybe 62 and 66. And so I ran into him and I was out. I asked him, I said, well, did you ever go to the Rockwood Club when you were in Fayetteville? And he kind of paused a moment. He said, Let's see, every Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday. <laughs> so I go, okay, I guess you went there a lot. But, but he told me what at that time, uh, um, and Randy has stressed this too that they didn't they weren't open all the time. They were open on Wednesday, Thursday, uh, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday. Oh. Uh, and I guess Dayton knew that uh, he, he was a, kind of an expert at this bar business. And, and it was a coincidence that one of the guys helping us on this has had bars, and he yeah. came to the same conclusion in the 1980s, whenever he's, he his bars, that it was better not to be open every night. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the lucrative the, nights were Wednesday? Well, Fridays? Wednesday was the case, according to Chris, was that was a night where the girls could go out and the guys could go out and have no curfew till like maybe 11. No. Normally it was... Because it was church night. Uh, I, I'm not, <laughs> that's the way I understood it. Maybe it was Thursday, Friday. I don't know what it, I think it was Wednesday, but and Friday and Saturday was big nights anyways. Because they could go out and they right. had a little later curfew. Later curfew. curfew. Yeah. But uh, he came here a lot, and like I said, it was only open three days a week. Well, I, uh, no, they would open in the afternoons most too. Most of the time. They, yeah. they did. I've seen advertisements yeah. where they'd have like afternoon jam sessions. And it would probably curfew. depend on who was running yeah, who the was running it, right? You know, yeah, it, it just. <clears throat> so, Sandra, in your research, are you kind of focused on this venue, particular venue, or? For the most part, there's yeah. some. See, the, the people that managed this, that came and went, there was like kind of a circuit. There were three clubs. There was one called the Shamrock Club, which Dayton Stratton, I believe, he owned that one, which was, um, it, it's no longer existence, but it's on the north end of town. And then there was the tea t- table that Mark referenced. Tea table. Tea table. T-E-E. And I was told it was because they had a driving range there. So... Uh, but the same managers would just kind of bump around, you know, yeah, bounce around, around. and, and uh, so, yeah. You know, Chris so Polycrown told me another story that's interesting um, about this place. Is that back in those days, uh, the university had a, uh, they had some sort of festival that was called Cabela. Oh, uh, Gabley. Gabley. And those were the initials for like all of the department. College, graduate, uh, arts, uh, science, uh, education, uh, business, and, uh, architecture, law. It was a student-run festival, and they they had uh, this went on every it was every year. They brought in, in name spring. name people right before I can Tina Turner, uh, mm-hmm. Chuck Berry, oh, and yeah. uh, you know on campus. Or? Yeah, yeah, they, they on played campus. on campus, but they usually brought them in for the weekend, and they would have them doing several different things. Mm-hmm. You know, panel discussions, I guess, and whatever so stuff like that that they do. I could do a soap dirty. I would have paid good money. They had, they had soapbox derbies. It was just a, it was just a big old party. <laughs> but so uh, Chris is telling me this story that he was in a fraternity, and uh, you may not know the guy because I didn't at the time, but his name's Pete Fountain. Yeah. He's a famous clarinet player in jazz, <laughs> and he was the one of the people that was coming for what's the name of it? Cabela? Gabely. 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 And uh, he was uh, one of the guests for that weekend. And uh, so they brought him in on like, I guess Thursday, or, and he was gonna perform mm-hmm. Friday and Saturday, I guess, but, or Saturday. And so Chris's fraternity was assigned to uh, entertain him uh, to Friday night because uh, 
he, they didn't have him scheduled for anything. So they bring him down here. And it just happens that Ronnie Hawkins is playing here that night. And, when, and this is probably late in the time that he owned it. Probably, it was probably 64. And so he bring, uh, so anyways, they bring Pete Fountain down here. And uh, Ronnie's playing and Ronnie knows who he is. And Pete had met him before, and so they kind of, the way Chris's story was, they kind of catch each other's eyes, and uh, Ronnie kind of goes, you want to come up? And this is uh, during, uh, early in the show, and he, uh, he said, yeah, uh, yeah. And so he goes out to his car, which was Chris Polycrown's vehicle, and he had brought his clarinet with him. And uh, he goes up there and plays with him, and ends up playing the whole night with him. Uh, two sets, and this is when the band guys were in with the Hawks. Yeah. And Chris said afterwards, Pete came to him and he said, "You know what? Those boys up there are going to be famous someday." Wow. And these are the stories we hear all the time. Like if you remember Charlie Rich, the Silver Fox. Yeah. And yeah. He he was a college student briefly at the U of A, and he used to frequent here. And then years later, he played here. Yeah. You know, this is probably in between before he became the country singer. Yeah. 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 And uh, we've been told that Roy Clark played here when he was backing Wanda Hawkins. Really? Um, Glenn Campbell, when he was briefly with the Chance, the timing is such that he would have been here when he was yeah. with them. So, wow. so the, the one thing I really, really love about this place is this is where a lot of people started yeah. before they got famous. Yeah. Yeah. Seals and Croft. Seals and Croft were also in the Chance. Yeah. So it was Seals and Croft, um, and then Glenn Campbell. Yeah. And then there's another guy that I'm really... He's so one just of my, connecting all those things, I think, is you know, just a rich musical. It, it really yeah, is. There's a guy named uh, Wayland... Wayland Holyfield. Holyfield. He wrote, um, what was it, Rednecks, White Socks, and Blue Ribbon Beer. Uh, he, he, he went to school here. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, he, he performed here. Yeah. Yeah. He's written. Went to school here. I also admire the here. fact that you're, you know, I, I don't know this, but is there kind of like a venue-based history, that music history that's emerging where... I'm thinking about Tipitina's down in New Orleans, some of these classic venues mm -hmm. where you kind of use that as an organizing principle for looking yeah, at all so the acts. That but if you're from Iowa, what's the place up there? The surf club? Oh, Surf Ballroom. Surf Ballroom, yeah. yeah. Surf Ballroom, yeah. Kind of. Still going? Yeah, yeah I know. So I was supposed to go like there. It's kind of <laughs> contemporary of this building. I've never been to a show at the surf, but I know yeah. people are there. Yeah. And, you know, it's right there on the lake. So. But, but, you know, yeah, but I mean, it, there, there's a history. You have Buddy Hayes. The, you know, the African-American guy yeah. that was the uh, jump blues musician who was an inspiration to Ronnie Hawkins. Yeah. Then you have Ronnie Hawkins who founded the Hawks, who later became the band. And the band, after Robbie Robertson left, who, who joins on the Cape Brothers. Yeah. And so there is there is kind of like a family tree, a lot, a lot yeah. of begatten, I guess you could yeah, say. That's right. that's and, right. uh, but, but that's what fascinates me. Yeah. Well, good luck with your uh, efforts. Yeah, and we hope to continue this tradition in the future with these younger people. Yeah. Uh, that are, are based Still a lot right of musical talent in the hills. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Those are. Awesome. So, yeah. you know, we, uh, our base right now is a lot of people who have been here. We're, we're all basically probably in their eight, 70s and 80s. So. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, we hope to, to get young people. And, we, and it's cool. That we're already getting feedback from these young people. Yeah. They know they're, they're hearing the history. We've been fortunate. We've got some really pretty good publicity. Yeah, yeah they love the band. They love rockabilly. That yeah. that's not going out. Yeah. You know, so. Uh, so we got people calling us wanting to play here. Oh, yeah. all the time we cool. get people. They they cool. really are excited for us to open. Well, thanks for doing this. Well, thanks for coming down. It's a classic venue. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank think, you for uh, yeah. making us feel important. A little yeah. Bit. <laughs> I mean, there really, there aren't very many of these venues in Arkansas left. Yeah. That that's the thing. Well, maybe years hence they'll be like, man, look at that oral history interview just before they took off. You know? Yeah. Who knows? But it could come back. Yeah. You might have more. All right. Thanks much. Hey, thank, thank you. you. Appreciate it.